Ed. He's going to talk to us about uh, corn insects, um, our neonic seed treatments, which are much in the news if you've been following that, and um, some really interesting opportunities for uh, biocontrol. So, Mike, take it away. All right. Well, thank you very much. And I don't know, is Joe, are you going to stay on the line, are you, at all? Yeah, I was planning on okay, Good. Yeah, because Joe, he can joke and interject because Joe is worked on this project is, you know, in in northern New York for a long time um, prior to his role at, uh, at Pro Dairy, and he's a good resource as well to have. And so I know that Joe and I both have worked on this together, um, you know, at trying to help uh, help bring this research forward from Cornell that uh, Dr. Allison Shields has been doing for, for many years um, up here. And so anyway, so <clears throat> going to go into um, a little bit on the neonics. I don't want to get too deep into the neonics. There's, um, I, I'll share a little bit of information on it that I have on the neonics and the seed treatments. Um, then move into some of these corn insects that we're looking at um, where the neonics might come into play. Um, then Briefly going to mention the alfalfa snout beetle just to talk about our hidden little pest that we deal with in northern New York. And that's kind of really what started all this biocontrol nematode work, um, you know, here in the state and then move into the corn rootworm biocontrol and then the application and, and uh, of the biocontrol nematodes that we're using here in the state. Um, so anyway, um, so going into the neonic seed treatments. Okay, neonics, they're a widely um, applied class of insecticides, the most widely applied uh, class of insecticides in the world, registered in 120 countries. Um, they're insecticides that we use on a vast majority of um, our corn and soybean acres here in New York State. Um, our neonic seed treatments, um, we're using them for many reasons. I mean, the big reason is it's a low cost insurance policy against small but devastating um, risk that we, that we assume when we plant um, corn and soybeans um, here in the state because we have some some secondary insect pests that um, that can attack our crop you know corn and beans that that really can wipe out seed um, you know seedings um, plantings rather um, cause replant um, scenarios and without you know the use of an effective uh, seed treatment um, we really don't have very um, good options for those right now for the control of those pests. Um, and also the unpredictable nature of these soil insecticides or these soil insects um, make this an attractive option. Um, again, once, you know, the damage is found, there's not going to be any rescue treatments, um, you know, when we um, have to deal with, um, you know, a, a replant possibly from seed corn maggot, for example, um, or, or, you know, losses there. So we look at uh, the use of um, of neonics in corn and soybeans. And so we're most uh, familiar with um, using them on um, corn and soybeans, and we use these for uh, for wireworm control, grubs, corn rootworm, black cutworm, flea beetles, and seed corn maggot, and then moving into soybeans, um, you know, primarily the neonicotinoids are used for seed corn maggot, um, soybean aphid, and bean leaf beetle. Um, you know, primarily for us, it's going to be the seed corn maggot. Um, so what are the benefits um, that we have with these neonic seed treatments? And we look at corn. Um, corn, it's um, they're they're really nice to have for us when we um, plant the corn. We can have the low doses of um, the neonicotinoid seed treatments put in on the seed, um, so it's already comes in on the seed in the bag. So it, you know, it eliminates that uh, planter box seed treatments that we used to use many many years ago, where we would you know rip the packages open or take the cans and take the top off, the metal top off, and dump them in the seed box or dump them in a pail and stir them up with a stick and then dump them into our corn, um, you know, our corn planters, um, you know, and hoping they stick to the seed and hope they're on there. Um, you know, these seed applied seed treatments, um, you know, that come in the bag are really nice to have. Um, so again, we, we use those for, um, you know, the low rates of, of poncho, for example, for the control of, of our emergence pests that we deal with in corn, that would be seed corn maggot and wire worms. And then if we use the higher rates, we can um, give added control of the corn rootworm. In soybeans, um, the benefits, um, you know, using these um, seed treatments, um, you know, work that's been done suggests that we can, uh, um, you know, reduce our seed, um, you know, reduce the um, seeding rates of our soybeans. So instead of 170 to 200,000 seeds um, per acre, um, you know, we can bring those um, seeding rates down to, you know, drop them down to 150,000. And these are slides, a couple of slides from, from Dr. Elson Shields, um, 150,000 um, seeds with a treatment. 
Um, and then we go, um, you know, he suggests 5% yield bump, reduced um, seed cost, profitable 25% of the time. And that's the challenge that we have, you know, when we're using um, or trying to um, quantify the, you know, you know, the value of some of these and some of the research trials when we look at um, using these seed treatments um, in corn and soybeans is sometimes we miss some of those pests because again, they're, they're sporadic, you know, it's hard to predict where they're going to be, you know, small plots and fields, a lot of times we can miss them. Um, so it's, you know, tougher to, uh, you know, to pick up, you know, true differences. Um, so with, with the seed treatments, um, you know, the neonic seed treatments, um, we look at, you know, replacement options if and when we were ever to lose those options for us here in the state. So our seed treatment replacements would be our diamides that we could use in corn and soybeans. Um, that would be effective. They're effective on seed corn maggot. Um, they're going to be weak on wireworm and they're going to be weak on the white grubs. Um, and also they cost more. So there's a, there's a cost, um, you know, that, that's associated with that that's going to be more than our neonic seed treatments. Um, and then our other... Um, uh, replacement to a seed treatment for some of our secondary insect or our, our soil, our emergence insect pests would be our pyrethroids in a liquid pop-up fertilizer. Um, for example, like capture LFR um, or some of the generics would be effective on some of our corn emergence pests. Um, you know, so we have those. So <clears throat> I guess the big question is going to be is, you know, how long will we have these neonics? And that's, uh, you know, the the, the question that it's going to be really difficult to answer. Um, certainly under scrutiny as, as um, you know, Paul and Dale have, have mentioned probably and um, talked about, in, you know, with growers and, and consultants in their area that, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, in the spotlight, there's a lot of scrutiny of um, the neonics and, and, you know, the potential links to, um, you know, the bee, you know, deaths of bees. Um, you look at Ontario, that was the first jurisdiction in North America to order um, a severe cut in the usage of neonicotinoid insecticides because of reports of bee kills. And that goes back to a bee kill that happened, major bee kill that uh, took place in, in 2013 in Ontario. Um, but they, you know, they really was not, you know, they couldn't find any direct links to, um, to the neonics um, causing that, um, unfortunately. Uh, the corn and soybean growers in, in Ontario um, paid the price for that. Um, so what they did is um, they looked at a phase out of, or a, a major reduction in the use of neonicotinoid uh, seed treatments in, in the province. Um, what they did is um, applying this to just corn and soybean seeds treated with um, neonic insecticides. So we're looking at gaucho, cruiser, and poncho. So those would be the neonics that they were using. Um, in July 1st, 2015, the new regulatory requirements um, for the sale and use of neonics in the, in the province um, began to be phased in over time. And so going into that, it was, um, you know, there was a, there's a lot that, um, that they unrolled, you know, over um, several years to uh, even to the point we're at today um, with, with their reduction of reducing the um, use of these neonic seed treatments. And the goal at the time was to reduce the, uh, the treated seed used on corn and soybeans in the province by 80% by 2017. And so it basically, um, you know, put the growers um, through, they had to go through um, IPM trainings. Um, so they had to get, um, go above and beyond the regular um, pesticide applicator training that they had. So they had to go through um, um, trainings and now it's to the point they're, they're far enough into the phase you know, the phased in um, program that um, they have to have third party documentation um, that they have to present um, of actual um, field by field um, assessments of the field um, where they set out traps for wire worms and such and they look for these pests and they have to have a third party person come in and, and verify that, that, that each field or these specific fields warrant the use of a neonic um, seed treatment on it. So it makes it very difficult for the growers to, uh, you know, to accomplish that. Um, it, early on in the, in the program when they rolled that out, it was, um, you know, the, the grower could do it themselves and do the reporting but now it's gone to the third party um, verification with it. And so it's been, it's, it's been a very difficult thing. And, and uh, um, a few years ago, we had uh, an independent consultant from Ontario come to our crop congresses in the North country and talk about that, talk about their, um, the actions that they took in Ontario and how it's, how it's worked. And it, it just looked like it was going to be very difficult for them to do. And I've talked with some of the growers 
um, you know, from the province, you know, just in the last year. Um, and they've said that it's been, you know, it's, it's difficult to do um, to accomplish um, what they were trying to do. Um, so how does this affect us? Okay, so they, they it was in the news with Ontario. Um, we still have a very high percentage of corn and soybeans that are planted um, in New York State that are treated with a neonic seed treatment. Um, there's certainly the possibility of a ban of use of neonics in New York State. Um, no question about it. Those um, bills have been presented to Albany. And, you know, currently, um, you know, as we sit today, the DEC is awaiting an EPA review of the neonics um, at the federal level, and they're expecting some changes to certain neonic labels. So I think that's what's going to be one of the drivers as to really what happens with the, with the EPA's review um, that they have ongoing with the neonic um, seed treatments. You know, so it could happen, um, you know, we may, you know, we may lose them. So, you know, how does that affect us? Um, really what we need to look at is, you know, we need to present, you know, data to support, you know, the continued use um, or value of these seed treatments that we're using today um, to continue to have those. And so, you know, one thing we can do is, again, we can try to do, um, you know, seed treatment trials to be conducted. And, you know, we've, we've worked on those um, statewide. Um, 2020, there's going to be more um, seed corn treatment um, trials looking um, in the state that uh, the New York State IPM program is, is um, conducting. Um, they're looking at, um, we're going to have a control treatment. We're going to have um, one of our replacements, one of the diamides next to um, the neonic seed treatment. And that's going to be in um, fields, um, you know, large field um, trials that they're doing um, replicated in the state. Um, so we're going to work on that on corn. You know, unfortunately, as I mentioned, the sporadic nature of seed corn maggot and wereworms makes it challenging to quantify these losses to the pest and research plots alone. So it's going to be, it's always a tough thing to do. And so really what um, we need to do to go above and beyond just some of these research trials um, here in the state is we need to document and start documenting losses from these pests in your fields. And so what that means is, is that if, if, you know, any crop consultant or agribusiness person or any grower, um, you know, identifies some, some losses, um, stand losses that they feel is, is a result of, of corn or, um, you know, seed corn maggot or wireworm, you know, in a corn or a soybean field, we really want to know, um, you know, if it truly was, you know, a stand loss caused by one of those two pests um, that weren't controlled, um, you know, by, by whatever reason. Okay. So, so we need people to be on the lookout this year as we move forward, report any damage as soon as it's, it's found. And so I would encourage you to reach out to Paul or Dale. Um, you know, if you've seen anything or, or suspect any of those taking place in your field and we need real time information so they can go back out because we need to physically document. That, yes, that's what it was. It wasn't, uh, you know, we want to document that it truly was seed corn maggot that did it, and it wasn't something, it wasn't slugs, it wasn't um, some other pest, it wasn't, you know, bird damage that, that caused those stand losses, or it wasn't a, a planter problem. We want to make sure that we're documenting true losses, um, you know, in the, in the fields from these. And so, again, we have to be able to, uh, to do that. So it's going to take a team approach from everybody, you know, in the industry, you know, growers, um, and as well, you know, the extension staff, you know, in the state, we're going to be certainly... Um, you know, looking for that, you know, as we move forward and trying to, again, document this, you know, to add to uh, um, some of the, the reasons why, you know, that, the, you know, the importance of, of these seed treatments that we have, um, you know, because it's unfortunate, you know, as we look at some of the, um, you know, information from, you know, or trials from other areas um, that, you uh, that are that, that get presented um, suggesting that um, you know there's not as much value to these um, seed treatments um, and the challenges that we have with it would be um, you know with our um, you know we're, we're a little different growing some you know region than um, say the Midwest in the Midwest um, you know they may not have um, you know the you know, the documented yield losses um, or stand losses to, um, you know, to, to those insects like uh, wireworm or seed corn maggot, for example. But the thing that we look at here that makes us a little bit different in New York State is that uh, 
um, we're using a lot of cover crops now. And so these cover crops, um, you know, that, uh, that um, as we do the burn downs, you know, and, and we have that decaying plant material, you know, it's going to be, you know, attractive um, sites for seed corn maggot. Um, it's also going to be attractive for, for wereworm. The plow down sods that we deal with, our animal manures that we're using um, also are going to, you know, contribute to, you know, higher incidences of seed corn maggot wireworm. You know, once, you know, we stop using some of these um, seed treatments that we have, or if we don't use those. <clears throat> so again, that's some of the differences that we may see um, here, you know, the New York versus some of those other um, grain states um, that we have. So looking at wireworm, just a couple of slides on, on a few of these pests, then we'll go into some, um, some of the rootworm stuff and then really get right into the, to the biocontrol nematode. Um, so wireworms, the larva feed on the roots and plant, um, you know, growing point and stem, takes several years to become the adult click beetle. Uh, the, the adult doesn't cause the plant industry, uh, injury, it's the larva that do. Um, so that's a photo of it. So just for those that aren't familiar with wireworm might be. Um, and so again, here's our, um, you know, the treatments uh, options that we have. We can use our seed treatment right now, the poncho or the cruiser at those rates. We can use it to control wireworm. Um, seed corn maggot, um, the adult female flies in search of egg laying sites um, close to decaying um, plant material or germinating seeds. Fields of manure, again, have a greater potential for attack. Um, and again, that's the seed corn maggot in, in a corn seed. Um, and you can see that, uh, you know, some of the stand losses and some of those photos that, um, again, Elson Shields um, shared these photos with me um, in this, um, again, treatment would be poncho or cruiser at the low, at the low, even at the low, the low seed applied rates um, are sufficient for control of seed corn maggot. Um, corn rootworm, we have uh, western corn rootworm and we have the northern corn rootworm that we have in New York State. Um, there's the corn rootworm larva. Um, that's the primary um, problem that we're dealing with at the stage. I mean, we do have some damage from the adult um, beetles, but mainly it's the corn rootworm larva that caused the damage. So the rootworm life cycle, um, the eggs are laid, um, the larva hatch, the larva feed on the corn roots, they pupate, and then the adults emerge. And so the newly hatched larva and pupa can drown in saturated soils. And so that happens once in a while, especially on our down drainage fields. Um, you know, we've seen that from time to time. Just a couple of years ago, we had it, um, you know, even actually a couple of years ago, just looking at 2019, um, 2019, um, you know, we had a significant, um, you know, uh, uh, mortality rate on um, the corn rootworm larva because the hatch, the corn rootworm larva hatch kind of coincided with saturated soils, um, especially in northern New York. So we did lose a lot of our um, corn rootworm larva, you know, that were there to, uh, to saturated soils. Um, here's um, a picture of the um, Western corn rootworm beetles feeding on the silks um, of corn. So silk clipping, this is a slide from Mike Stanyard from um, Northwestern New York CCE. Um, spraying uh, for corn rootworm beetles um, to prevent silk clipping. Hasn't been shown to be economical in New York. I know that we've had some growers, you know, in the you know past have, have made or had a custom applicator go in and make some applications because they thought they were um, going to have some problems with uh, silk clipping um, from the corn rootworm, but uh, you know, typically not going to be shown to be an economical thing that we're going to see here in New York. The threshold would be a silk clipped under a half an inch, 15 beetles per plant, five beetles per plant in drought stress conditions. Um, so those will be some of the thresholds, and it's pretty tough. I mean, we can see it, you know, there's times you'll go into a field and you'll see quite a few beetles on a, you know, uh, corn rootworm beetles on a plant, you really think that there's got to be a lot of damage taking place, but, uh, you know, generally it takes quite a, quite a, quite a heavy uh, um, feeding to do that, um, to warrant any application of insecticide on, uh, for the control of corn rootworm beetles. So the symptoms of larval injury, um, it's pretty easy. They, they just clean the plant roots right off. They take those roots off and then it causes lodge corn. Management of the corn rootworm, so first year corn, um, no, no actions necessary because we're not going to have any, um, um, because what happens is, is they have to lay their eggs um, the season before, um, so they're not going to lay their eggs, you know, in a sod field, so first year corn, so they're not going to lay them in soybeans or on wheat or, or um, sod, so first year corn, we don't have any action necessary because there's not going to be any larva there, 
um, second year corn, um, just the high rate of seed treatment. Um, the cruiser or the poncho was sufficient um, to uh, control the corn rootworm. You know, we get into third and fourth year corn, and then that's where our risk, our yeah, our risk, um, you know, increase for damage from from corn rootworm, and that's where the high rate of seed treatment can be used. Um, you know, in concert with, you know, the, even the, um, you know, we could use the, the BT, the corn rootworm um, below ground protection for um, the rootworm control through the BT corn. And then we can use soil insecticides at planting. That's another option using like force um, with a planter, um, the planter, um, you know, through the T band on the back of the planter. Um, so the uh, corn rootworm resistance to the BT events, um, now um, the resistance has been been reported to all the BT events across the Corn Belt um, in New York, Pennsylvania, Virginia, and North Carolina. We've got uh, resistance to the 3BB1 and the MCRI 3A. Um, and in 2018, Nelson um, has reported increased uh, damage on the CRI 3435. So with the resistance, um, you know, coming in with these um, to these BT events that we have, uh, you know, here's some pictures that Elson took um, also. Um, of failed BT cornfield um, from corn rootworm in New York State. These were some of the first fields that they found in the state um, with a failing um, BT corn event um, in the state. So here's some other photos um, of what it looks like. Um, some of the goosenecking that you'll see on that photo to the left there, you can see uh, you know, a compromised root system there where the feeding had taken place. Um, so with that, we have to ask ourselves, how long are we going to be able to use these BT corns to control corn rootworms? So as resistance, you know, increases and we get, um, you know, and there's not, and there's not much coming in the pipeline. And that's the thing that we always, you know, talk about in the weed control side of it too. When we talk about resistant weeds, you know, everybody's like, well, when's that next chemistry coming? When's that next new site of action? You know, the same question can be asked here on the, on the corn rootworm. When's the next, you know, BT event or the new one coming? And it's going to be a long time before we see that. Um, so unfortunately, you know, it's going to be a case that we're starting to lose these a lot quicker than than we're replacing them with new tools in the toolbox. Um, so with that, you know, we we move on to just a couple of slides on on the snout beetle, just to give you a little bit of a um, information on uh, um, you know where where this you know nematode stuff that we're going to talk about. Um, started. And the alfalfa snout beetle, this is just a map. This is our hidden pest, our secret pest that we keep in, in northern New York. Um, and it's, uh, you know, a pest of, the, of um, alfalfa. And, <coughs> excuse me, it's got a different life cycle on the, um, that beetle there. That's the um, snout beetle. That's the adult. The adult, it's got a uh, quite a different life cycle. The beetle spends most of its time underground. Um, very, very, um, it doesn't come out of the ground very often at all, only to migrate and lay more eggs. And so what they'll do is they, um, they'll lay their eggs at the base of the plant in May or June, the larvae feed on the roots, and they'll feed on the roots right through November. So, I mean, the ground can be um, fairly cold and, and uh, you know, it's not uncommon for us to go out into the fields into November and dig up some alfalfa roots and find, uh, you know, snout beetle larvae feeding on the roots. Um, and then, uh, so that does a lot of the destruction there. So we'll have these fields um, that get the roots um, compromised in um, late summer into the fall and the plant death occurs. And then in November when the ground gets really cold, the larva um, burrow deep into the soil. Um, and then in the spring, these fields, um, you know, there's, there's these huge dead spots in the field and it's stand, you know, the stand loss is very evident and it's blamed on winter kill. So we just say that it was our cold winter that did it. We don't think that you know, the larva did it. Um, and then also the, uh, you know, in year two, the larva move closer to the soil surface and then uh, they'll pupate and become inactive adults. And then in year three, the beetles emerge and feed on the foliage, very, very little on foliage. And then they're just gonna migrate and lay more eggs. Um, and so this is what some severe um, stand losses look like to uh, um, in an alfalfa field. That's an alfalfa field that, uh, you know, all those brown spots there, I mean, in, in patches there, that's some um, alfalfa that was um, taken out by the alfalfa snout beetle larva feeding. Um, this is what the alfalfa snout beetle larva look like. The root feeding um, can be. That photo on the bottom left, you can see the um, larva is just burrowed right into that root and they'll just clip those roots right off. They'll um, girdle them and then they just take them right off. And then there's really just nothing left, um, you know, in fields. Um, 
in fields like that, you can just walk over to a lot of those plants and just with your foot, just scuff the um, crown of that plant, and they'll just come right out of the ground. Um, and again, in that shovel full, that's not a stage shovel full, that's just going out into some severe damage and it's not uncommon to find sites like that where you can just dig up, um, you know, dig up the, uh, um, the, you know, the soil around the roots and you see the larva there. Um, so really what that's led to is, um, you know, trying to control it. So the snout beetle too, I should have mentioned it, they don't fly, they just walk. Um, and they've been, um, so they walk, so they don't fly. So they, they just kind of stick around in the North country for us. And um, again, because they don't, you know, they're not out of the ground, um, it's the larva that does the damage. Okay, so this is what's doing the damage. So, um, you know, there's really no effective way, and they've tried lots of different things for many, many years as, you know, control methods to control these, and it's hard, you, know, you can't get an insecticide down there to control them, and it's not effective to try to control the adults as they migrate because they're only out of the ground for a small period of time, and it's, you know, that's just not, insecticides don't work on them. So we had to find another way to control the alfalfa snout beetle larva. And so one way would be a very short rotation because of their life cycle, we can do a short rotation, uh, seeding year, two production years, and then plow it back under. And then that's one, you know, one way that some of our growers have, have implemented control of the alfalfa snout beetle is just a very, very short alfalfa rotation. Some have quit growing alfalfa period and they've gone to grasses and then um, now this other method that we have is, um, you know, with the work that Elson Shields has done is, you know, totally different. And that's using the, um, these native enema pathogenic nematodes um, that we're using to control alfalfa snout beetle. And lo and behold, the um, benefits of these nematodes that we're using, these biocontrol nematodes, um, we're finding very good control um, of the corn rootworm as well. So it's kind of a, a double bonus for us in the North Country because, you know, growers that have been applying and treating fields with these nematodes for the control of, of snout beetle, you know, early on, the early adopters didn't, you know, didn't realize that um, they were actually, um, you know, gaining the benefit of corn, corn rootworm protection as well. Um, so here's what it looks like, the alfalfa um, beetle killed um, sod on the left. When we put the nematodes on and treat the field, you can see the protection that it provides. So again, it's been a great, uh, um, a great tool for us to try to maintain our alfalfa stands in the North Country. Um, so the persistence, so this is what um, is, is interesting and this is really what, uh, um, you know, got um, Elson Shields to think about, you know, hey, are we getting corn rootworm control? And so you can see here in this um, chart here on the left, um, they applied uh, biocontrol nematodes on an alfalfa stand in 2008. And in 2008, it was alfalfa, 2009, it was alfalfa. They plowed it up because they had to look, because we had to, um, you know, the big question is, is, is when we make these applications of these biocontrol nematodes, do they persist across other rotations besides just alfalfa? You know, do they go through a wheat rotation? Can they go through a corn rotation? Can they go through a soybean rotation? You know, and how long can they persist across these different rotations that we're using on farms? So in 2008, um, here's just an example. And, and they saw this happen on many fields because they would treat, you know, on, early on in the research that, that Elson would do is when they applied them onto a field, they had to look at persistence. So they would apply them and then they would come back in and they kept checking to make sure they kept sampling every year to make sure that they were still persisting in the soil and didn't know how long they would last. And, you know, do we have to treat every couple of years? Do we have to treat every five, every 10 years? How long is it going to last? So anyway, um, applied in 2008, alfalfa, 2009, it was alfalfa corn, first year corn. You can see the levels of the um, of the two different species. So you're going to see a blue bar and a red bar. So we're using, um, every time we make applications, we're using two different species of, of um, biocontrol nematodes um, in the field. And so they're using Carpacels, Copsia, and Feltii um, in the field. And you can see in first year corn, you know, maintaining, you know, good levels. And then all of a sudden in, in the second year corn, they had a huge spike in the, in, uh, the uh, you know, the, the nematodes. So they were feeding on something and finding something there and then back down in the third year and fourth year of corn. And so that kind of piqued the interest that, you know, hey, this might be corn rootworm that they're feeding on. And so that's what, um, whoops, sorry about that. And so that's what, um, you know, what, what the conclusion was is that they were getting some. So they thought, well, we're going to take that farther and look at uh, the control of corn rootworm, you know, with, um, with these biocontrol nematodes. And so I mentioned that, uh, that 
and they've tried different different combinations of other ones. There's another nematode that they do use in different crop systems as well. Um, but these are the two that they've zeroed in on that have worked the best. So you've got two, and we use two of them, um, the carpet capsia, and that sticks around. They're, they're an ambush type nematode that, that stick around in the top two or three inches of the soil. And then the felty eye kind of hang out in the lower, um, the lower um, uh, pro soil profile. So we have that, that top profile that's, uh, that's covered and so it works out well to have both of those species in combination applied to fields. And so looking at um, corn rootworm, um, the injury, um, so you can see the top acceptable injury or acceptable um, corn rootworm, no damage um, to a few uh, roots pruned and then unacceptable would be across the bottom. You could see the one node, two node and three nodes. And so the work that they did, this is some, um, some trials that Elson did at, uh, at the Aurora Research Farm. The field was treated with biocontrol nematodes in 2014. Um, this is conventional corn, untreated check. And you can see the Iowa rating score of a 1.9 node gone. So you can see that the feeding um, caused by the um, pressure from the corn rootworm in that field. Um, that same trial in the, in the uh, treated um, the treated strips where we had uh, the two different species of nematodes uh, partitioned in the in the treatments. Um, again, these were applied in 2014. Um, in first year corn, this was in 2016. Um, you can see um, how, how they've protected it and how the roots, I mean, they were just, you know, really good shape and there wasn't the damage from that. Um, so looking at some of the, uh, uh, the root ratings, you can see on the left here, um, conventional corn, um, you can look the blue, um, no, um, no EPNs, um, none, none of the um, anemopathogenic nematodes um, applied, that's the untreated. You can see the, uh, um, the damage that was done compared to the two different uh, combinations of the, um, the two different uh, uh, nematodes, the SC and the SF versus the SF and then the HB is the heterobrodites. Um, and you've got uh, those two different combinations. You can see that, um, that they're controlling the rootworm. Um, and then you look across the bottom, this is um, comparing it to the, uh, um, against some of our GMOs, our, um, the corn rootworm corn. And you can see that, um, that we're um, able to achieve, um, you know, control of corn rootworm um, equal to some of our um, best GMOs out there um, applied in the field. And this is some work that um, has gone above and beyond New York State. I know, um, well, I don't know all the places now, but um, there's a lot of work that's being done elsewhere. Um, I know um, Elson is working in, uh, um, done a lot of work in Delhart, Texas, worked in, um, he has trials in, uh, in, in New Mexico now under center pivots. Um, he's done work in, he's doing work now in Kansas. There's going to be trials done in, in Colorado, Nebraska. Um, Michigan, they're trying it in a lot of different states, trying these, um, you know, these nematodes that we have here, <coughs> excuse me, that Elson's been using here in New York State and looking at it for corn rootworm. And also um, um, one I didn't mention, um, one or two of the insects I didn't mention that, that we're getting control from um, these biocontrol nematodes is actually um, seed corn maggot and wireworm, wireworm in, in particular. And also now there's um, some preliminary work that Elson is doing that's suggesting that we're getting um, control of seed corn, seed corn maggot as well, um, you know, with uh, the biocontrol nematodes. Hey, Mike. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, we're right at 3.30 now. Mm -hmm. um, yep. You guys you got just a few more slides? Yep. Or? I can do that. Yeah, I can get right through the quick thing on the current, the applications. We're going to go right through it. So Great. we'll do that. Thanks, Paul. So right now, the current nematode applications, what we're doing is um, we have th this option um, of no specialized equipment. We can use any field sprayer. Um, we can make the applications. Um, what we do is we, we make them um, like this is just streamer nozzles coming out of the back of a grower sprayer. Um, we make applications after 6 p.m. We have to avoid the UV damage to the nematodes when we stream those on a field. Um, so how do we get these nematodes on? This is with a commercial sprayer doing the same application. So if you were to order um, these biocontrol nematodes from Elson's lab or from, um, we have one other person in the state that has a lab that uh, rears the nematodes that we're using. Um, that we're, you're buying cups of dead fish bait. That's all I'll tell you. You buy cups of dead fish bait, they come inoculated with these nematodes. And so the challenge is that we have is that um, now we have to get the, these nematodes out of the dead fish bait into water and then into the sprayer tank. And so what you do is you get these cups, you take these cups, we have screens that you use, 
and you screen the, um, you put the sawdust and the dead, dead fish bait on top of these screens, you hose them off with a nozzle, the, the water takes this, um, we collect the water in the bottom in a big garbage can, the garbage can gets dumped in the sprayer and then we stream them on. So that's how they're um, put into the sprayers. Um, so our new application method that we had, um, that's been a challenge, I mean, it's not a challenge, I mean, it works, we have custom applicators that actually do this um, for, for growers and we have growers that's, that do their own <clears throat> and it works well. Um, you know, there's some challenges that we have. I mean, the challenge is, is it's time consuming to do the screening. We have to spray them at night. You know, the growers or the custom applicators want to do them at certain times of the year. They can't do them in the springtime, you know, during you know, herbicide application timing and during side dress times. So we're doing them at, at other times. So it fills in some good for them. But again, it's time consuming to do. Um, so another method that we are, we looked at, so this is um, just Joe Lawrence and I, I talked Joe in, this is before his pro dairy days, I talked him into um, trying it because, um, you know, I've said for years that we could do it, apply them with liquid manure. Elson didn't think it would work. And so we had to prove it, that, that it would work. So we set up a small trial in a field looking at liquid manure and different rates of biocontrol nematodes in those five gallon buckets. And you can see Joe and I putting them on plots went back and soil sampled it and we had good good um, success doing that with a small scale trial. So then we moved it further to the field looking at uh, applications with manure and uh, so this is what we've resorted to now as a, as a method. This is our second, we've gone, we've completed two years now of, of testing many fields in the North Country. Um, just taking these, um, taking the fish bait and you just dump it in the top of this, uh, the, the uh, manure tankers and uh, so that's what we're doing. Um, you know, I've got a couple more slides and I'll be quiet. Um, these are some of the results that we did and it's, it's encouraging. This was our first year in 2018 on, on a field scale size of it, looking at it with, um, with farms. Um, we, we used pretty high rates, application rates, because we thought we'd get quite a bit of mortality. And uh, so we went pretty high rates. Um, we were able to, in, in a sprayer situation in water, they'll survive in water two to three hours and then they have to be um, emptied out of the sprayer. In manure, when we did the um, trials, you know, once we get to about 25 minutes or 30 minutes, then the mortality starts to increase quite a bit. We could take them out as long as 45, but fortunately, um, the longest that we had in any, in any tank situation on a farm was about 22 minutes that we kept them in the tank before it got emptied. So um, we clocked it. Um, the manure tank circulation didn't seem to uh, matter at all. Um, this is um, some snout beetle on the left. This is one that um, we did in 2018. It was applied in the summertime. We went back in the fall, um, pulled up some, um, some snout beetle larvae, and you can see the activity already just from um, summertime application until the fall. Um, so it can show how quick it can work in the field. Um, this is 2019. Again, we've had success with every field that we've done. 2019, we reduced our, our rate. So we've got a rate down a lot lower, so it's more cost effective. And again, manure tank, it doesn't seem to matter. We were able, we were effective at, uh, in any of the fields that we've done with um, so far with all the um, tanker treatments that we've used. So that's what I had and I'll take any questions on it.